You, you know, I, I mean, listen, I think fear is a sign of intelligence. On today's podcast, I have none other than the legend Laird Hamilton. Many of you know that I am an aspiring surfer. I've been surfing for probably about five or six years, but really only within the last two and a half years since I've been living in Costa Rica have I been able to surf almost every day. In that two and a half years, I've gotten a lot better. But Laird Hamilton takes it to a new level. If you don't know Laird Hamilton, there's a documentary on Netflix called Take Every Wave, which is about his life. Laird was one of the first to pioneer toe surfing at Jaws outside of Maui and has done incredible feats with surfing, surfing massive waves, surfing Chopu in Tahiti on incredible days. I mean, he is really an incredible human and he has a very unique perspective on fear, health, relationships, raising children. I really think there's a lot of gems in this podcast. So hope you guys enjoy this one with legend Laird Hamilton. And I hope that I get to go work out with him when I'm in Los Angeles soon. I think I'm gonna make it happen. I'll do some content and share that with you guys. Laird, thanks for coming on the podcast, my friend. It's great to connect with you. My, my pleasure, Paul. So I was trying to think of where I could even possibly begin a podcast with you. And I found this quote in your book. So I'm going to start with this quote, sort of like Tim Ferriss style. And this is a quote from Thoreau. Disobedience is the foundation of liberty. The obedient must be slaves. <laughs> Laird Hamilton, what does that mean to you? <laughs> Holy shit, man. <laughs> that means, that's everything. That that's everything. That's that's a that's like I mean that's for me, that's my life. But I, I just yeah, what does that mean to me? I mean, that just means that if everybody's going down the road, you know, north, uh, I'm going south. Or if everybody's going east, I'm going west. It's just like I don't know, I have a friend that talks about being a contrarian, but I have a tendency to and, and sometimes to my demise I will add, but just to, you know. When everything's to go in one direction, I'm I'm always you know it's almost a knee jerk reaction to go the other way. It's almost just like a like a, just like you know what it could be done different. Uh, you know I'll think different. I, I don't. I, they're not cool. It's you know whatever it is. I just you know and sometimes I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I would say I would say a lot. I'm not 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 necessarily right, but it just feels right to me to to be resistant to do something different than what other people are doing. Yeah. Where do you think that comes from, from you? Because, I mean, we've never met in person. I hope we get to hang out at some point soon. But as I was preparing for this podcast, I was watching a movie about you and learning about your childhood. And like, I mean, I guess I just identify with this contrarian ideal. And I'm just curious. I mean, where do you, where do you think that comes from for you? Is this your childhood? Is this growing up as an outsider? Is this nature just makes you want to do something different where does this come from man well my 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 stepdad said that you know big wave riders are born and not made so i think you're born with a certain thing you know a certain drive a certain kind of just you're born with something and then i think that your environment your surroundings your your experiences either fuel that you know fuel that and 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 nurture that or or suppress it, or uh, so I think that it's a combination of you know of, of all of it, right? It's a combination of something that you're born with, being in a certain, you know. I I, I know that that uh, because I because of how I grew up uh, in in Hawaii, being uh, being being of a you know a different a different color, um, you know that that I mean I was always kind of segregated in a way. So I was always already, I was, you know, I used to say, you know, if people don't like me for what I look like, why would I be concerned if they didn't like me for how I act? And so I think there's something to be said about that. Like, you know, I don't have any say in, you know, my, my genetics are, I can't just go back and go, Hey, wait a second. Can you just give me some different genetics or, you know, which at times I think I would have probably wanted to do if I could have come out as a giant Hawaiian you know, like a giant Hawaiian warrior and gone to school and lived in that environment as a giant Hawaiian Polynesian warrior, I would probably like that. I would have been like, but I don't know if that would have actually put the pressure on me that I, that, that I benefited from, right? I don't think that would have squeezed me in a way that, that in a way that, that drove me to do uh, some of the things. But I definitely think that I had, I, I had a, you know, I think I was born with a certain kind of thrill-seeking attitude. I just think that that's, 
you know, that's what, like I said, because, you know, my stepdad said that for a reason, because it, it is a certain thing that people have, right? There's like a kid that just broke the, you know, some w- biggest wave measured, biggest wave ever measured, ridden, you know, and, and he's from Germ- like in Germany, inland Germany somewhere. But, you know, just my point is that you're just kind of born with some of this stuff. And then, you know, and then you get to, you know, and then it's, and then it's nature, nurture. I mean, kind of all of it. All of it works together. I mean, I can imagine, I didn't get, I didn't get picked on a lot growing up, but I got picked on a little bit. I think mostly everyone gets picked on some these days, but it sounds like because you were a blonde white boy among native Hawaiians growing up, you got picked on a lot. And it sounds like it was kind of pretty brutal for you when you were a kid. You definitely stand out. And when you look like uh, a relative of one of the guys that, you know, contributed to the downfall of the whole place, that doesn't help. <laughs> you know, you, you look like a, a relative of Captain Cook. They probably don't. That, that doesn't go over well. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it, yet, yet within that, you know, I had, I mean, my best friends were Hawaiians and I had guys that used to hurt, you know, kind of, I always said that I had a couple uh, really, you know, great Hawaiian friends that used to make at least the fights would be one on one. You know, they'd come in and they'd make sure that, you know, five guys didn't jump you when you weren't looking. They'd make it even. So, you know, that that but you, 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 you know, you I mean, growing up like that it wasn't fun. That wasn't like a, a an enjoyable thing. I wouldn't change it if you said, hey, go back and change it. It's interesting because, you know. I grew up in Hawaii in that environment. So I, I was more, you know, in the dirt. Like I lived next to a, um, you know, I lived, I, I mean, I lived at a time in Hawaii also that, and, and in a place where they were still doing a lot of living off the land, you know, they would fish, they would hunt, they would farm. Like everything was kind of, you know, that, that I think the, the old man Ty Hook would buy, you know, his only thing that he would actually buy was like a bag of rice. Like, and, and that was only because they weren't, farming rice anymore in the fields. They were farming, you know, they were back to taro farming. But my point was, is so I grew up off in that kind of environment. And then I'd come to a place like California and I kind of, I just looked like your typical California surfer guy and, and, but was such a different mindset, just your whole, the way you look at the world, the way you conduct yourself. It's like, I, I mean, homecoming, like people were like, I mean, I mean, I was like, I, I never went to prom, prom, like what's prom, prom. I wouldn't have gone to prom. You'd be running for your life. And, and so it's like, a, you know, you can't have a girlfriend because she likes you, but you know, the brothers don't and the, you, she can't go out with you. And I mean, just all that stuff, you know I mean? It's, 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 and I'm never complaining about it. I'm only describing it to, to, to shine light on just how part of the mentality uh, that when you grow up in those environments that, um, you know, my, my, if somebody says to me, Hey, where are you from? I go earth. I'm a human from earth. And if you're something different than a human from earth, I'd love to have a conversation. Let's sit down and have a meal and talk. Cause I'd really like to hear about where you're from and what you're up to. Uh, but if you're a human from earth, let's get that behind us and let's just go into, you know, the next stage of, of, uh, you know, of, of kind of communication and a relationship, you know, it's interesting. I think that out of necessity over hundreds of thousands of years, humans have needed to be tribal, but that often works against us today. And, and I see this in what I do. Um, there's a lot of tribalism in the health space and, and I see it in Costa Rica. I mean, I live most of the year in Costa Rica and I think that it doesn't happen a whole lot. There's not a lot of localism in the water here surfing, but if you are different than people that are here and they see you as someone that is negatively impacting their life. They see you as an other and it becomes this competition. And there's, that's where crime comes from. It seems like, you know, when there's inequality and they see you as different, there's like this kind of tribal mentality. Like we are all supposed to have the same amount. So if you have a nicer car or you have a surfboard or you have a camera or a drone or something or a phone, if you have an iPhone, I'm going to steal that from you. And so that, that a lot of petty theft happens here, I think because of that, tribalism, but I see it more also in like the health space and that the people want to go into camps and we want to say, I'm a vegan, I'm, I'm a carnivore, I'm animal based. Like I don't eat this. And it's just, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. I just, I don't understand why it happens. Um, 
but it, it's just, I think it's human nature and it's hard for us to overcome that. It's probably just, I think that there are, are pieces of what we've brought with us from our evolution into 2023 that serve us well and others that don't serve us well at all. It's just, we're sort of having to unlearn all those things, it seems like in some ways. Healed our daughter's food allergies. Check out this review on histamine and immune from Heart and Soil Supplements. This is a pretty incredible supplement, you guys. In 2021, my 16-year-old daughter became suddenly highly allergic to a number of foods, including citrus foods and seafood. She couldn't even cut a pineapple without her tongue swelling up. My wife and I took her to an allergist. They suggested Benadryl, EpiPens in case of emergencies. We were lost and saddened that our daughter couldn't enjoy a lot of the foods she used to enjoy. When I heard about Heart and Soil's histamine and immune option, I ordered it immediately. We let our daughter take it for one month but before trying citrus foods and seafood again, and the allergies were gone. No reactions whatsoever. My wife and I cannot thank the crew at Heart and Soil and Dr. Paul enough. We are forever grateful this product exists. The amazing thing about organs, guys, is they contain unique nutrients and peptides that you don't find in a lot of other foods. Histamine and immune is a really special one, as you can see from reviews like this. It contains thymus, lung, kidney, liver, and spleen. Where else are you gonna get thymus, which is the organ where a lot of your immune cells are programmed? Where else are you gonna get lung and liver and spleen and kidney with diamine oxidase to improve histamine reactions? The reviews on this product are incredible. Uh, so if you have histamine intolerance, gut issues, allergies, any of these problems, check out Histamine and Immune from Heart and Soil Supplements. You can find us at heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to radical health. All of our supplements are made from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle living in New Zealand on regenerative farms. They're all packaged in glass because plastic is bullshit. Why would you want more of that in the environment or containing your supplements? Check us out at heartandsoil.co. Well, I was talking about that earlier. It's interesting. I mean, I, I as, as a tribe, just appreciate you and appreciate. I go. I believe that that's part of the greatest success for CrossFit. I think CrossFit was the CrossFit tribe. I go. I mean, not to okay. Not saying that the, that working out hard and that whole and that workout program isn't great. It's not about that. It was more that they're just a, they were you're a tribe. Like it's like going to church. Like we're like it's our. I'm a, I'm a, I'm this guy. I'm going to this church. This is what I do. You know, it, it, it is interesting how we. How we, uh, you know, I was talking earlier today uh, about another thing that it seems like, you know, how we're, you know, how we have this automatic, this little voice in our head that always is looking for the path of least resistance, right? Like, it's like, it's like a biological mechanism. And it's a little voice. It's like, oh, yeah, you don't need to do that. Just go over here. You don't need to work out today. Just go to that couch. You don't need to do that. Like, it's like this little voice that we're, and that probably behooved us immensely well when we were out in the wilderness and you were trying to avoid every single danger that there was and you were trying to survive because all those little gains and ease actually made it so you could survive. Now that we're in an environment where there's just virtually no threat, so to speak, I mean, not ones we're used to, <laughs> uh, you know, now we're now that's working against us. Now, all of a sudden, that that little voice that's, that's trying to save us you know, any resistance or put it, you know, looking for the path of least resistance is working against us because now, we're, now we're having to ignore that and go and try to put stress on ourselves in order to get the benefits that we need that we're not getting because we're, you know, we're not in the environment. And I think there are so many Pandora's boxes that have been opened for us that will never be shut. Um, I think the first time a human being ate a Skittle, we were doomed. Um, no and, doubt. you know, and, and I think the first time we ate a French fry cooked in seed oils, we were doomed. And the first time we ate some sort of synthetic processed food that hits this bliss point in our brain and, and releases more dopamine than we're used to for any given amount of calories, we're kind of doomed. And the first time we looked at a screen on an iPhone or, or, a, or a smartphone with Flickr, and it just, it just pulled us in and release dopamine in our brains. It's just, we're kind of doomed. And I think, shit, we're sort of like, we're kind of in a tough way in 2023 as humans, uh, having to almost unlearn all of these impulses that we have. I mean, this was a question that I was going to ask you at the end of the podcast, but I think this is a, a good moment to ask it. I mean, how do you see us as homo sapiens, as humans from earth in 2023? Because you've gone against the grain your whole life. And I know from reading your book and, and, and hearing you talk on their podcast that, that you sort of have this perspective of where we are as humans and what's gotten us into trouble. And I'd love to hear you talk about that. Like, 
it's kind of a, you know, a segue from what we were talking about with exercise and food and stuff. Like, where are we? How, what's gone wrong? And how do we fix this, man? What do you think? Well, I just, I think we're so uh, far out of our biology. I think we're so far away from, from our, our nature, right? I think, I mean, you know, we got these lights, we got this temperature control, we got the thing, we got the ease of everything. I mean, we're so far away from any stress. And it seems like we're just seeking things out that are stressful in order to, to receive some of these, these feelings, these, these, these hormones, you know, these reactions that, that this, that the environment provides us with that we actually need. And so I think we're having to like, make it up, right? Like we're having to, you know, I, I was talking to Gabby the other day about like, well, why are people so fascinated with scary movies? I go, because we have a scary movie, like we have a scary movie vault. Like we have this vault of fear that we need filled. And because we don't have anything we're doing, like I don't need scary movies because I probably can, I've experienced enough scary things and do scary things often enough that I don't need a scary movie. Like I'm scaried up, but it's, why do people are, why are they so fascinated when I'm like, because they're, they're trying, you know, now we're having to, we're having to like, simulate a day's work in a gym right now we're having to simulate you know sim simulate gathering simulate environmental exposure in our ice tub and simulate it in the in the sauna i mean we're just seeking out all this these you know we're having to move like animals because we don't move like animals we're having to like so we're we're craving all this we we intuitively sense that we need this stuff that we're not getting in our modern, in, in, in our, in our modern world. And, and I think the biggest thing, uh, I mean, one of the biggest things that's really uh, creating a lot of bad behavior, I would say the thing is our relationship with death. I think our relationship with death is horrific. I think, I think that, 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 that is dictating a lot of mis bad behavior because people are so scared of dying. Uh, and that's because they think it's the end. And so I think when you think that death is the end, then of course you're scared because everybody, you know, what, if everything's going to end, then, then what would you do? Well, you would try to hold on. Right. And so, I mean, the whole thought that you would download your consciousness into a chip and that somehow that would live on or that you would try to stay. I mean, I go, I told somebody, I go live for a hundred years. I'll be good. Like, I'll be good. Like a hundred years of this shit. Like, let me out of this place. I'm good. I'm done. I mean, like, okay, 105. I mean, 95. I mean, 90 years. This is a lot of, I mean, that's a lot of torment, 90 years. I mean, I think I'll be okay. But so I think that, I think that that's, I think that's a big piece, you know, our relationship, our fear of death. I mean, if you watched what happened during this whole, this whole, you know, COVID nightmare, I mean, that was the response to people's fear of death, right? You want, you got to see how the animals act when you scare them, you scare them and you scare them with the, the thing that's the most scary, which is the single most scary thing is dying. That's just, I mean, pretty much that's the apex. Everything else is a trickle down from that. If I don't get food, I'm going to die. If I don't get a thing, I'm going to die. If I'm too hot, I'm going to die. It's just always, I'm going to die. Everything's I'm going to die. So, you know, if you, if you, and you got to see what, how we act, I, you know, I, I talk about like, if you scare an animal, in a room and you can have a room, just a room with four walls and you have an open door, but you scare that animal, really scare the animal. The animal will go in the corner and just run against the wall. I mean, there's an open door. All you gotta do is just turn around and walk through the open door, but they don't, they just bang their heads against the wall. And so, and I think that that, that fear uh, and then the, and ultimately the greatest fear is death. And so I think people's, you know, our relationship with death, especially um, it, we're so, because we're so, far out of our biology. I think that we had so much, uh, death was every corner. Like when we were, when we were evolving, we were at death, every death was every, oh, death was there. Death was there. Death is the animal's going to eat. Death, you're going to fall off the hill. Death, you're not going to get a warm place to sleep. Death, you're not going to, I mean, it's just, it was, so we are, are, we had an intimate relationship and I think we've grown so far away from that, uh, especially in all of the developed countries. I mean, I, I think if you, you know, go into the, into the jungle somewhere, it's still all okay. But, but, you know, in our, in our world where we are, I mean, we're just not, we're not good with it. We're, 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 we're terrible. And we have, and the people, uh, you know, at the top are the most scared. Uh, and that's probably because they probably have, 
they're probably not ready to go up and stand in front of the guy up there and be cool with it. You know, like, <laughs> cause, cause if you got to go meet the guy and you're standing there and he's going, okay, well, how, how'd you do? Well, how is it? How are you? Do you feel okay about your conduct down there? They might not be so good about that. What, what has shaped your relationship with death? Because I remember growing up and I went to church growing up. My family was Catholic. I don't really identify as Catholic anymore, but I must've been nine or 10 years old, maybe 11, maybe nine or 10, let's say younger. So I'm not totally embarrassed. And the priest gives this sermon and talks about death. And I remember I'm just sobbing after church and my parents are like, just trying to shuttle me into the car. They're embarrassed about, and I'm just thinking like, I don't want to die as a nine-year-old growing up in the suburbs of Virginia. I have very little experience with nature. I've not seen death. And it was just thrust in my face by this priest. And it was overwhelming for me. And my parents essentially wanted nothing to do with it. They were embarrassed by my overwhelm with death. And, and I don't know how they could have handled that better. That's a separate discussion. But I'm curious for you. I mean, what, what has shaped your relationship with death? Because a lot of us are not exposed to it and don't want to be exposed to it. This is a tough thing for a lot of us. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think it's, I, I you know, well, first of all, your faith definitely affects your, your death. Like if you believe, you know, what you believe definitely has a big impact on how you respond to death. Because if you think that when you die, it's over and then that's the, that's the end of it. And you don't, and you, and nothing's happening after. Well, that would make death a lot scarier than it's a transition into another, another, another space. Then you'd be like, huh, okay, well, I'm uncomfortable with the unknown, but, uh, you know, I, I, and, and I think that whether that's true or not is really beside the point. It's just, do you benefit believing that while you're living? And so, you know, and I think sometimes people, uh, you know, I, 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 people talk about religion. You know, they talk about the Bible. I go, well, listen, if you looked at the Ten Commandments and you followed those, would it make your life better? And and you and you actually follow the Ten Commandments, you probably have a better life. So either way, it seems like probably a good idea because it, no matter what, it's going to benefit you, the here and the now. So uh, so I think that your faith has a huge, you know, your so that's the the beginning. Right. And then your exposure. Do you, do you know people have died? Have you seen dead people? Like, you know, uh, I mean, it's like, I talk about, you know, everybody, eat, you know, eating, eating animals, but then they don't want to realize that an animal has to die. It's like, well, it doesn't come in saran wrap. Like it's not just like, you know, it doesn't just appear in a saran wrap. They want to make it do that. That's their, their next thing. But, 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 you know, this thing, I mean, we're living a life and death thing. If you're around nature, you know, you're around animals, you're around, you know, birth and death and life. I mean, this is just part of our world that we're in, unless you're in these bubbles, unless we get into these, these bubbles where we don't have any exposure. And then death for you is like, you know, is, is a video game where you're just shooting people and they're falling over and then you don't, and then you're really disconnected because then you're, then you're almost a sociopath at that point. Cause you're like, you're not even connected to like, no, that was a person. And they die. And so you have to have that. Um, so I think there's a lot of layers to it. But I, I do believe that your faith sets your reaction completely. That's going to determine. I know for myself that I've had an opportunity. I mean, I think everybody probably has to, to maybe not everybody, but pe people have, you know, like gotten to experience. Uh, and I've had more than my fair share of like, I'm going to die, like being in situations where, I'm going to die and I might, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make it. And, and so I, and, and I think that's, um, you know, I have people I know that have died. I've seen dead people. I, you know, I mean, I've just dealt just being in Hawaii, being at the beach, being, seeing people drown, seeing guys get smashed on the bottom, see, you know, those, those things. So I've had a fair amount of exposure to it, um, o o over the, over my lifetime and, and, and my own personal, um, you know, kind of feelings of, of uh of it and and so i think that that's that's that plays into it you know that plays into your your because i think how you act about death is how you live i think that you're i think that it's a little bit like our scarcity mentality you know we have the scarcity mentality. we just we need, we need more we need more we need more and we think we're always out but somehow we have more than we need you know i think that if you're you know i i i definitely believe that you you know 
And also you don't really know what's living is until you're kind of on that line, right? Like that you go to the edge and you kind of go, okay, where is the, you know, it's like a little kid needs to fall down the stair. You need to, you've got to go to the edge and like, oh yeah, okay, well, right there's the edge. Like on that side, it's a no-go. And this side, we're still here kind of thing. And I think that that's a, and that's a more honest way to live. That's just that you just, ch- it changes your whole perception about each other um, and, and, and your position in the world too, like what you, what you are and, and your significance or insignificance in, 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 in most cases, you know. And I think that, I, I love that you bring up this packaged meat idea, because I think that in most of our lives, we're, we're insulated from death and we're never shown death. I mean, I've had so not many videos death. removed, not real death. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fake pixelated death. But I've had videos removed from TikTok because I'm showing me hunting with a tribe in Africa and there's a dead animal. When I post on Instagram, a picture of me with an animal that I've hunted and killed and part of this cycle of life and death, it, it gets a lot of engagement, but I have, the, I have more unfollows than I ever have. You know, people don't want to see death. And I think that uh, this goes into like a lot of the arguments around, around, around veganism is people are, are worried about, about seeing death and they don't think it should be a, a, a real thing that we, should, we shouldn't inflict this on animals. But I think that there's all sorts of interesting ethical arguments there for and against. And I, I think that humans would live better, different lives if we knew where our food was coming from, whether you believe it's ethical or valuable to kill and eat animals or not. I think that understanding where the food that's nourishing you is coming from, that changes you as a person, kind of in the same way that being in nature and being in more risky situations changes you as a person because you are actually sort of on the edge of that. It's, it's not whitewashed for you. It's not sanitized. When, Laird, when you're dropping into like this famous wave at Chopu, like that is, I was watching it before this call. It's freaking, I mean, you're, you're, we'll put this on the YouTube video or something so we can, people can see this wave. I mean, how tall was that wave, do you think? And, and the force of that wave at Chopu. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, that, you know, it's interesting because waves are, are, I always describe waves like dogs, you know, because everybody, I, I think we get caught too caught up in the height. I mean, that's a, that's, right. a large, that's a large wave, but, but, you know, it's like, what's, you know, what, what's more dangerous, you know, a great Dane or a pit bull, like, you know, right. you might actually want a great Dane chasing you, even though they're twice as big tall, but you know, and so that wave is that wave is just notoriously vicious, and it breaks on a um, on a live coral reef, so the water is actually extremely shallow. And uh, and actually, a, a month prior to that ride, a, a guy got a guy got killed there, uh, hitting the bottom and ripping like ripped half his skull off. And and so, but that wave uh, that wave was was significant for me, but also for our for our perception about what's rideable, you know, so because what the technique that we use and until, until uh, we rode that wave, that was considered unrideable. That was considered the unrideable zone. And I mean, looking at that mm-hmm. wave, there have not been many waves at Chopu that have been ridden like that. I mean, Matahi Drole rode a wave in the last couple of years that was pretty big, but I mean, that's a massive wave was, <laughs> I'm just looking at you riding that and I'm thinking, I mean, you must look back on that and think if you had not made that wave, there's a real chance that you would have gone to the next life. Like yeah. A legitimate shit. Like that was, and your butt was like so close to the edge of that wave coming up behind you. Yeah. When you're dropping into waves like this, do you think about death or is it all just like flow state? The only thing is getting to the bottom of the wave. Yeah. I mean, in that particular have- on that ride, I had a conversation with myself. Like I had an internal dialogue going, uh, at that, uh, on that, on that, on that wave itself, just because everything slows down so much that I was able to kind of, um, I mean, things slowed down because, I mean, I try to always explain to people, I go, you know, things slow down because assessment speeds up, you know, you make the way you make slow motion film is you speed the film up. I go, so when people, you know, when somebody talks about, you know, seeing that in an accident and everything slows down is because assessment speeds up. So, and when you're threatened, assessment speeds up. And so I was highly threatened, assessment was sped up. And so I was having a dialogue. Um, I always say it's between the horns and the halo, you know, we're having a little horns and halo conversation. And one, one voice is saying, Hey, you should jump off. 
And the other one's like saying like, well, no, but if you jump off, you can't make it. So maybe you should try to stay on. And then if, if you get knocked off, well, at least you stayed on and tried to make it. And so then I had a whole, like, I have a whole, like a little, like an internal dialogue and that all happens within like a five to seven second, you know, it's, but somehow you can have this conversation. Uh, and so, but yeah, on that, on that ride, I definitely had a, had a, had a, uh, had a, had a conversation because the wave was doing, um, it was drawing the water in a way that I had never experienced on any wave that I've, and I've been surfing um, at that point for, you know, 25 years or more and, and been exposed to, um, or maybe 35 years. Like I've been, or, uh, 30 years, something like that. I've been serving a long time to, at that point. So I had kind of experienced most of the things that could, that you could experience. I, I thought at least. So when I was in that spot and I, and I was having a whole new kind of, uh, you know, a whole new, a whole new terrain, like this, everything was doing things different. I had to kind of improvise. I did a couple things during that ride that, that were unusual, um, that they talked about. Um, I didn't even think about that. I, it was only brought to my attention after I was finished that I put my hand on the down on the inside and leaned another way that actually since then I've seen people try to, to, to ride that wave on the, on some of these kind of giant days and not do that and crash, you know, and have some pretty horrific, horrific stuff go on. And so, but yeah, I was able to, to do, to kind of improvise in, in that, in that moment, um, as well as have that conversation uh, about, about, you know, Hey, you know, you jump, don't jump, jump, don't jump. If you jump, it's, you know, that whole thing. So, but yeah, that was definitely a, you know, that was a gift for that. I think that, I mean, I don't say I ever deserved anything, but that was definitely a gift that came to me for like my life's dedication to surfing my, my, all the stitches and wounds and, you know, all the stuff that I, that I, that I've uh, kind of put down on the, on, you know, on my, in my work in that, in that, in that arena, like all those, all that, you know, uh, invisible suffering. What do they say? What you do in the dark, I reward you openly with. So I did a lot of stuff in the dark <laughs> and, and that was a, and that was an open reward. Like, Hey, okay, here you, here you go. And it was, so that was an emotional, it was an emotional, um, emotional ride as well. What is your relationship with, with fear Laird? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a surfer, but nothing like what you do. I've been surfing for about five or six years and only really been surfing every day or mostly every day for the last two and a half years in Costa Rica. So when it's above a few feet overhead and I show up at the beach, I'm just, I have this conversation with myself, like you should paddle out. And part of me is like, I don't want to fucking paddle out. I could die. (laughs) And, And in fact, I had that conversation with my friend this morning and I show up and I say, how big are the sets? And he said one foot for Laird because he knew I was doing a podcast with you today. And it was, it was, it was kind of a scary, it was kind of a scary day for me. It's a pretty top to bottom wave where I live. It's pretty hollow. And so I'm always trying to think like, how do I, how do I manage this fear? And is there some nugget here for people doing things they're afraid of in their life that are not in nature, that are not with surfing? Like what's your relationship with fear? How do you address that? Do you even feel it? Or is it just, this is the big wave surfer and you like, you don't see the fear. You know, I, I mean, listen, I think fear is a sign of intelligence. I mean, if somebody says they're not scared, I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I need to stay away from you or, or we need to keep an eye on you because you're going to do something dangerous. So in a way, I feel like being scared is, I mean, that's part of assessment. If, you know, if you're sitting in front of a giant bull in an arena and the bull's look, putting his head down, stomping his paws and you're sitting in front of him, it might be a good idea to be a little scared. Now, what you do with that, is a whole nother animal, right? That what you, how you harness that. I mean, I always talk, I, I just talk about the antelope. I go, you know, when the antelope's scared, he outruns the fastest animal in the world. So that tells you what fear can do. I mean, fear, fear is an incredible, I, I mean, grandma can lift a car up or mom can lift a car up if her baby's under there or she's scared. So I think that, that fear, you know, is a sign of intelligence, is a sign of assessment. What And then what you do separates you. You know, some people freeze, some people, uh, you know, run, some people, I mean, fight or flight. It's like, you you know, so I think that there's a big, that's a big piece of it. I think, you know, uh, that exposure, you know, the more you get, I mean, you know, the, the more times you go out on a day like today, 
you know, you get 10 days in, you get 20 days in, you get 30 days in, you get 40, you get pretty soon you get 100. I mean, you, you, your whole, you know, the first time you go 100 miles an hour, you can barely even see down the corridor, right? And then the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the, the thousands time, you, you, you're, you see the crow on the fence post. So I think that there's exposure, you know, when you're scared of something, I think when you go and kind of in, in, indulge yourself in it, you, you eliminate one of the biggest factors in, in fear is, which is the unknown. So all of a sudden, you know, you start knowing it, you start, okay, thing, I got hit, I got pounded, I got held down, I came up, I made it, the next one hit me, I survived it, okay, I survived that, I survived that, I survived that, you know, so I think that there's a big, there's, there's something to be said about that, uh, you know, I think some people just have a natural kind of uh, they, they, they have a, they, some people are, listen, some people are more comfortable with being scared than other people. Um, I, I think that you can definitely, uh, learn. I mean, I think you can get better, better at that, uh, as well. Uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, it's an interesting, um, I was having a conversation, but we were talking about free solo and then they were saying, you know, they did a study with the guy, uh, with Alex and they said, you know, his brain just reacts differently than other people's brains and da, da, da. And I'm like, and I was thinking a lot about that for a while. And then what came to mind was that, was that, and cause I could only speak from my own personal experience and ha- my relationship. And so what happened, what I believe happened to him was something that I could probably relate to, which would be like, and I'll give you my, my, my story of it. And I believe his is probably almost parallel, which is like, when you're young and you get put in a scary posi- position, let's say you get sucked out in a riptide, or let's say you're in his case, you're hanging from the rocks and then you think you're going to die and you don't die, but you're in, but when you thought you were going to die, your body went into full flight or, you know, fight or flight. You're in full, full, everything's on. You do that once, you do that twice, you do that a hundred times, you do that 200 times, you do that 400 times, pretty soon you didn't die. Your body's not going to put you in that same spot anymore because it's just too taxing. The, the body's the body's like, hey, I'm not going to put you in that state. That's too taxing on me, my, on the system. It's just going to be, it's going to exhaust me and you didn't die. So I'm going to have to recalibrate what we, what I, what you, what, what would be my normal thing. And I'm going to recalibrate to this next thing. Up. And I think that if you do that a few times, then your whole perception of danger and your reaction to it starts to change. I mean, that's what I believe. That's it just makes sense to me because I'm, I'm trying to analyze it like, OK, cool. You're born that way and you got some special gift, you know, like you're some thing. I go, nah. let's just look at it from like, hey, we're all even. We're all about the same. And let's work from there. And so that's what I kind of surmised from that, that I was like in my own case i was i i was in rip current so often when i was a child getting rescued when i was very young sometimes not getting rescued having to get in on my own sometimes no one was around and i'd be sucked out to sea and all of a sudden i'd be out there and i'd have to figure out how to get back in and i would be running through my head i'm gonna drown i'm gonna die i'm blah, 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 and all that stuff and then you do that enough times pretty soon you're like okay here i am in the rip again yeah i got in the last 500 times i'll get in this time and so i think that you you so I think that's part of the cultivation of that, of that, uh, which at the, from the outside would seem like such a leap, right? Coming from zero, you would look at that and you'd be like, that seems like such a massive leap that you would all of a sudden be able to recalibrate your reaction to fear, which ends up actually being useful in other dangerous situations. Like you come into other situations, whether you're in the mountains and there's an avalanche or your, your whole response to Jane, Dane, danger begins to change. You just have a different relationship with it because you've developed it. You've developed it over time through exposure. And so it, things are more, more uh, known and than they are unknown, which gives you a certain level of comfort. So that's kind of my, my, my kind of, you know, my, my perspective about, about that mechanism. There's this line from Dune, the book um, and the movie, Fear is the mind killer. And I love that because it really is. And I think that I've never thought about fear and my response to fear as like a muscle. 
that I can develop if I just keep leaning awesome. into the if I keep leaning into the fear and I keep doing the reps. And that that isn't necessarily only surfing. It could be having a hard conversation in a relationship, in a business setting, in like I guess it could be, you know, physical danger if somebody's threatening you or your family. It could, I mean, for me, it was it was jujitsu when I first started doing jujitsu and just getting smashed all the time and thinking, man, I don't, I don't want this, but I should lean into it. Or, but I think there are so many things that we fear in our lives. And I think it's Tim Ferriss that said something like, a metric for how successful your life is is how many hard conversations you're willing to have. And I think that, you know, I, I think of the hard conversations I've had in my life, and I'm always a little afraid. It's not even necessarily a hard conversation. Maybe it's just talking to a girl that I'm attracted to or asking someone out on a date or doing something. It, there's so many things, but I think you're right. I think the more that I do it, the less scary all of it becomes because I get more exposure to it. So yeah, and I think, I think that's really valuable, like you're saying, because it, it translates into all areas of my life, hopefully. Um, and I find myself gradually becoming more confident in the ocean. I still get freaked out. I still get scared, but I am paddling into bigger, steeper waves. And, and, and just, I think that I know from experience that, that I'm going to be okay and that I can send it. And then if things don't go right, I can just jump off the roof and kind of pin drop or something. And like, okay, I'm not going to die with that either. But I mean, when I first moved to this part of Costa Rica and started surfing these waves, it was, it was crazy. I was, I didn't. I definitely thought that I was going to die. And I think this, this makes me think like the David Goggins thing, like I probably was nowhere near dying, you know, because like when I'm getting held down, I probably could have held my breath way longer, but this, this buildup of CO2 makes me feel so panicked. There have been multiple times that I thought, oh man. And there's, I mean, I want to talk about surfing and flow state for people and how to translate this to people who haven't experienced this, but there's a unique things that happens to a human being when you're on your stomach on a board and there's a wall of water coming towards you. And you're thinking that is going to land on top of me. What do I do? And that's a, it's a unique experience that be, many people probably haven't had. Um, but it was, it's been interesting to work through for me. Um, whenever I hear Joe Rogan talk about surfing, he always goes, hell no sharks. I'm not doing it. And I think I, I just wish, I just, I just want Joe to have that experience because it's flow state. And I think Joe gets other experiences of flow state in his life but I wanted to talk a little bit about flow state because I kind of have this theory that when humans experience flow state in nature, we're changed as humans and we're really never the same. I mean, I think of it for me, like the first time I experienced flow state was when I was skiing and skiing powder and then it became surfing. And, and it's just, it's, it's really captivated my life. I mean, how would you communicate the experience of surfing to someone that's never surfed because the majority of people that listen to this podcast have never surfed. They'll never probably never ride a wave and experience that flow state. But like, how could you ex explain or communicate flow state surfing that experience in nature and water to someone that's never done it? I mean, it's a little bit like trying to describe a color, you know, it's, it's, there's some difficulty to, to, but I, I mean, first of all, I, I always want to say that surfing, everybody's a surfer. It's kind of like being an alcoholic. Everybody's an alcoholic. It's just whether you drink or not. It, 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 everybody is a surfer. It's just whether you've surfed or not. There's no one in the world that wouldn't enjoy the sensation of being pushed along on a board by a wave. There's just that feeling. I, I don't care if you're a grandmother from the middle of Russia. Like, I don't care who it is. Anybody gets on a board and, and gets that, that sensation. I mean, it, 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 because it's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a primal, like there's like a primal thing that we have. And that's part of the reason why it scares us so much, like by waves doing being in the water, because we're, we're, we feel so at the mercy of it. It's a little bit like being attacked by an animal. You know, you feel like the thing got you and you're just getting it. You're just at the mercy of it's every whim. And you kind of, and we don't like that. We like, we don't like to be, we don't like to submit in jujitsu or in any, especially not in the, you know, the ocean scene. And then it adds drowning to it. But when you talk about the flow state, you know, there's a Timoth Timothy Leary has a crazy quote of talking about, and I don't remember exactly, but it's something like, you know, it, it's the, the here, it's the, it's the greatest experience of the here and now because the past is exploding right behind you. And it's one of the few things it's the, it, you can actually tell what's happening behind you by looking forward. So it's a, a weird phenomenon when you understand what's happening, that you can see what's going on in the back of you 
by looking at what's going on in the front of you, the way the way the water is moving, and you uh, you know there's a there's an aspect of flying to it. You know there's a there's a a piece of a sensation of like flying, but you know everything goes away. So if you ever talk about meditation, you talk about you know being able to just kind of be in the here and the now. It's man. It's the manual version of that. That's kind of what flow state is. Flow state is a form of meditation. People don't realize. They go, yeah, because it's active meditation, which really takes. I mean, to be able to med- meditate at the level in which you're going to experience, like when you go into a, riding a wave and the sensation you feel on riding a wave, for you to be able to meditate that deeply, you would have to be a Tibetan monk. Like you would, you would need to have devoted you know, 35 years of your life to meditation to be able to be that undistracted and and that present to, to get that feeling where you can do it within a year or two. Or I mean, you're going to feel it the first ride. You're going to get a little, like a little piece of it, but then it's going to be, then you're going to crave it, you know, and, and, and uh, but you have to subject yourself a little bit to the, I mean, I, I appreciate Joe says sharks and stuff, but that's his disclaimer for not having to actually go out. Because I'm like, come on, Joe. There's no sharks. It's only four feet deep, and they don't want to have anything to do with a wave. But uh, but we're gonna get him in the water. That's it. He's gonna. We're gonna get. He's gonna. You know, he can kick a bag as hard as a moose. But I gotta get it. We gotta get him on a wave and let him feel a little bit of the. You know, the ocean grab. The ocean's little wrap and squeeze. <laughs> I yeah, exactly. Like he needs to do jujitsu with the ocean a little bit and, yeah. and feel and feel that because it's it's just that or. I mean, well, there's something about water too, though. But there's something about the water, the ocean itself. I mean, there's a a friend of mine has a crazy book she just wrote called the uh, called the Underworld. It's a new book called the Underworld. It's about the bottom of the ocean, but it's talking about the oceans. I mean, everything that's ever existed has a DNA uh, thing on the bottom of the ocean. So, I mean, and I I told somebody I have a I've had this theory which she she just confirmed, which is that you know that the ocean is the cloud of of the world like of nature. Everybody talk about the cloud. They're putting, we have a cloud. We, man's making this cloud. He put all the information. I go, never mind that cloud. I go, the real cloud is the ocean because everything that's ever existed or can exist will is in the ocean. Like the ocean is, has the, it's the big memory bank of all that's ever been and including what's happened in the world, every species, every, anyway, and any to, to be, but the, uh, but but the, so the ocean has that kind of power. So when you're in that, in that, I mean, there's a, uh, you know, you have negative ions, you have, I mean, you have a bunch of other things that are happening and for just you being in that, in the, in the, in that, in that water. And in a way, surfing is just a relationship with the ocean. It's an excuse to go like people, well, I can't believe surfers. They wake up at four in the morning. I go, yeah, to be in the ocean. Like they're going to be in the ocean and they're getting all the benefits of being in the ocean. And then they get the reward of riding a wave, which, which is like, you know, that's like the icing on the cake. That's like the, that's the, you know, that's the, the beauty of it. And the, and there's, and there's an element of fear. It's like, it's like a really beautiful woman that you're kind of scared of because you're, because you know, she can just crush your heart. And so you're like, you know, it's like, okay. You know, it's like, well, I met Gabby. Okay. You know, like that kind of, you know, do a thing. What do I say? What do I say? The right, you know, all that, but all that stuff that, that, and we have a, a deep biological mechanism that is just connects us to, to it. Why do we like to, you know, why do we want to live near? Why is the real estate value so high on the coast? We want to be near the ocean. Like we want to be near that, that, that element. And so, but yeah, the, the, I mean, surfing is a, is a, people have spiritual, you know, they have, a, and most surfers are naturally defiant. Like if you look at most surfers, they're, they're very defiant in general. Like and most of the surfers, at least the ones I know, if they're not, I'm like, Hey, I, I'm questioning your surfing, but, uh, <laughs> but naturally defiant, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, and there's a, there's a, uh, I mean, the ocean just has, has a power that really connects us to nature. It puts us in the, really the right, it puts us in our proper position like it, it it lets us know where we fall in the in the you know in the ethos and and i think that that's i think that when you come out approach life from that position i think that that's the that that really works it, it works there's this there's this interesting documentary from patagonia it's called fish people 
I just love the title. Like we really are fish people. Like we've, we've come from the ocean. When we put our face in the water, we get this mammalian dive reflex. And the deeper we go, the more the heart slows down, the more the blood wraps around the alveoli and the lungs to protect the lungs from collapsing. We, we are, I don't think people understand how quasi aquatic humans are. We don't have gills, but we have mechanisms that allow us to dive down pretty deep in the ocean and adaptations, all sorts of things that, that connect us with the water. There's one of the, like the, the best part or one of the funniest things in your book, this is sort of related, but sort of not. Do you remember what flying is by the Hawaiians, how they used to navigate? Yeah. This is in your book. <laughs> this yeah. is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. They put their testicles on the bottom of the hole and they can sense what the wave, what the wave directions are and know where the islands and know like their navigation techniques were crazy because they were I mean the, the Eskimos had 300 names for the kinds of snow the textures of snow so imagine the 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 people's perception and, and obviously your testicles are highly sensitive so you would feel vibration pretty quickly in them so and those and those and by the way those weren't fiberglass holes so you weren't worried about the fiberglass these were wooden big wooden holes but yeah yeah they had a few other I mean Besides navigating by the stars and understanding, you know, all the, I mean, the, the, but that's again, that intimacy, you know, imagine the intimacy of people that really knew every plant and all the medicine, like all the healing plants and all that, all the stuff that, I mean, we have plants to cure every single thing that we have. I mean, we have like, but a lot, a lot of this, we've lost all that, that knowledge, you know, that, that, and that was just having a relationship with the environment, like really, and then having multiple generations with it, where the intimacy that we have experienced throughout our evolution with the environment, that's why it's so effective on us when we're in it, because we've had such a long standing, deep relationship. It's, it's like, it's inside of our, in our marrow, it's in our body. It's, it's like, it's, we're, we're so connected and we need it. We need to, we, and that's why, I mean, I think that, that people need to spend, I mean, it's amazing what a walk in a, in a jungle or a swim in the ocean does to you you're not when you're a little off you come back and you're like oh look at the sunrise look at the sunset look at the stars look at the thing look at the you know i mean it seems to cure a lot of it seems to cure a lot of imbalance it definitely fixes a lot of things um left hand turn here what are your thoughts on sunscreen and sunglasses laird well, you knew what categories to go after right away, didn't you? The um, well, what the guy say? The guy had a great quote. He goes, the, "You know what? The only the only sunscreen to use a hat and a shirt, t-shirt, long sleeve." I mean, I'm not a big fan of sunscreen. I I, I never have been. Uh, I mean, listen, I don't. I won't get into the science, but I I mean, I think the highest incidence in melanoma are in uh, dark skinned people in northern latitudes. People aren't that are not getting enough sun. I don't, I mean, I think we were designed for the sun. Um, I think it has to do with our health. I think it has to do what with our diet. I think our diet probably affects our, our, our consistent exposure. Like if you're, if you don't go in the sun at all, and then you fly to Jamaica and you rub sun tan oil and lay by the pool at high noon. I mean, and you're like, you're, you're Irish, maybe not a great combination, but, but in general, I go, I mean, you, whoa, that's, I mean, we need the sun. Like that's, I go, I told, so I always just tell people, if you want to know what sunscreen is doing for you, spray a plant with sunscreen for two weeks and then tell me what the plant does. The thing will die. Like you don't think you're not more connected or as connected to the sun as a plant. Because I mean, if you're not, then maybe I'm in the wrong place. I need to go, you know, take a trip. But uh, and so and and most of the stuff is just horrific chemicals. It's just the, what's the, in that crap. And I mean, it's like if Gabby, you know, the only excuse I'll take is vanity. Like if a woman's worried about wrinkles and she's worried about her face uh, pool, like you can't, you got me. I, I'm not, I, I can't, I can't, I won't battle on that one. But as far as this other stuff, it's like, Hey, just hydrate. And also I think, I think too, if you stay cool, like if you're not getting hot in the sun, bare skin, like you're in the, you're in a stream, you're in the ocean, you're constantly keeping this, the skin temperature cooler. There's less chance of really, uh, of really burning. Don't go out at high noon, go in the early, go in the late. I mean. Um, Wear a hat, wear a T-shirt, and and sunglasses. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, you're not letting the light in. I think we have a lot of issues based on light. I think light, we can do a whole, you know, an hour long conversation just on light itself. I think that that between our phones and our fake lights and 
and the lack of sunlight in our eyeballs, the lack of actually walking in the dark. I mean, our eyes are muscle. And so if we, you know, we go in the dark, it opens up and then we go in the super bright light. I mean, I've been solar gazing probably for 25 or 30 years. I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, solar gazing. I mean, listen, and also like, for example, your skin, I told somebody, you know, I go, your skin's not smart skin. You, you know, this, the light has to go into your eye to tell your body that, that, uh, you know, that there's sun out and then you make the melanin. So I, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of, uh, of stuff that, that is happening to your system that, that you need that light. You need that direct light exposure. It's just like you said, when you dip your face and, and, and then you, you know, and then you're, and then the body goes into the mammalian effect and you can hold your breath longer and you can actually be in the ice better. And there's all these benefits. I go, well, I go, it's the same thing with the light. I mean, you go into the sunlight, the system can, can be prepared for the brightness, like get, get ready for the bright. Yeah. Yeah. What about diet? What's your diet like these days? What kind of stuff are you eating? What have you eaten today? Um, you know, I, I am pretty, uh, I'm pretty plants and, and animals. I mean, I'm, um, that's kind of how I, I sum it up, but, uh, you know, I had some eggs. I hardly eat any, any grains or, I mean, I like nuts. I like fruit. I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a kind of a fat guy, fat and protein. I mean, I like, I like, I like, you know, wild fish and wild game and wild stuff, but I, but I'm, you know, I'm plants, I'm plants and animals. I mean, it's, it's all where I am and, and what I, I think, I think we all eat too much. Um, I think that's probably one of our bigger issues that, that, uh, that we have. And, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, of trying to eat local. Like I go to the farmer's market and get all the fruits and vegetables from the area. That's a, that's a big piece. Um, you know, I'll go fishing and if I got friends that fish or, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking for that. I like, I, I, I have a fair amount of, uh, of eggs. Um, I'm not, I'm not insanely, I'm not you like in my, in my kind of my strictness, I should probably be a little stricter. I kind of like the being more durable in the sense of, I, I want to be able to eat whatever I have to, if I'm somewhere, like if I'm, if I'm in a place where they, I just did the, the food doesn't, it, you know, I just have to eat whatever's there. If I go someplace in the world, I want to be able to handle and not just be short circuiting because I don't have what I need. I think that's the biggest thing is just the dur the durability. But I'm always I like I wake up in the morning and I and I have a and I drink some minerals. I probably have like a I'll cut a fresh lemon in water. I'll drink some some ocean minerals and then I and then and then my you know I love coffee so I'm a coffee fat guy. So then I have you know I have all my my superfood uh, creamer stuff that I use and 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 so that I do that um, as well. But fat, fat and coffee till the afternoon, then like a meal or two at night. That's my kind of my, my go-to. Do you eat any organs? Do you eat any heart or liver? And can we eat liver together? Preferably raw, Laird. Sure. I, I, I don't, I, I grew up in the jungle, so I'm not, I'm not shy to, to, I can do whatever you need me to do. I'm, I'm like I said, I, I, it's all about the durability, right? I need to be able to go wherever I need to. If I got to eat rocks. Um, I'll, 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 I'll eat rocks, you know, do you do cheat meals? No cheat meals. Yeah, not really. I'm pretty, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't really snack. I'm not a snack guy and, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a huge snack guy. And, and so, um, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, and when you say cheat meal, what do you, what do you mean I, you know, this was one of the questions that the audience had for you. People think of cheat meals, and I'm not a fan of this, but people will try to eat, quote unquote, healthfully. And then like the rock is a good example of eating a cheat meal on Sundays or once a week, he'll have just a ton of garbage. They eat healthfully five or six days a week, and then they'll just eat a bunch of junk food one day and then go back to their strict diet. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, I mean, listen, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I, I've, like I'm, I'm friends with Paul Check, so Paul Check and I um, have been friends for years. Uh, you know, he gave me some great advice years ago about just, you know, plants, animals. Uh, you know, 
if it wasn't here 10,000 years ago and da, 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 and the refinement, refined stuff. And so, I mean, I try to, I try to avoid, uh, any kind of pro like just stuff that's, that's just not, not alive stuff. I mean, I grew up in Hawaii, like, like I said, in a, in a village. And so I was used to connecting food to energy. Like you eat certain things, you eat limpids and you just get this, you get, you know, you, you get, a, a, a lot of power from food and then food is more like fuel. Right. So I have that little bit of that mentality, like foods like fuel. And so I think that changes the way you approach, approach it when you, and you're not eating out of taste buds um, you're eating and you're, and you, and you try to avoid, I mean, the more I can know the source of what I'm eating, the better. I, I prefer that. You can't do that all the time, actually reasonably without it taking up all your time. Really? So I have that a little bit like my, my, uh, you know, my kind of my philosophy around eating in general, you know, I like to, yeah. I mean, I just, you know, I grew up drinking coconuts off coconut trees and, you know, like pulling papayas and out of the thing. I mean, I just, that's, I, that's, so for me, you know, that, that was a pretty normal, that's how I would just normally approach it. I just approach it like that, but I don't, you know, I don't, I've seen friends that were too, you know, they were so particular that it would take them, you know, two, three hours just to get what they needed to get to eat. If they couldn't get it, the stress, the stress kills, you know, killed my one buddy. Like he died from the stress of not having it. So I'm a little bit, you know, like I don't want it to, I don't want to be too fanatical at the same time. You know, it, it, can I eat a, some, something, something no good for me? Yeah, I can, but you know, it's, I'm not doing that day in and day out. That's just not right. Happening. Right. I think that I like this idea of connecting with like the energy response from food. Um, when I eat liver or when I eat like good meat or like, like watermelon juice or coconut water, it's just, you can feel better. And I think that for most people, the, the tragedy is that there's so much noise and they don't understand how their body is feeling and they don't understand their mood is all over the place and they didn't sleep well. And they can't really sense whether a food is making them feel good or bad. And so mm -hmm. I think so many people have lost this feedback with their food and because their diets are so complicated by processing of food, their light is kind of artificial, their sleep is messed up and all these things. So, but I think if most people did that, if many people would turn to like simpler connection with the way that they felt after eating a food, they would probably understand this idea. I think, I think that's a great place that's like a great foundation. Just don't eat garbage processed food and you'll be healthier. Well, and like you said, which is more, which is equally as important, if not more important, connect to what your foods, how you make you feel. But I mean, if you're eating garbage all the time, you're feeling, you feel so terrible. You can't even, you can't even differentiate what it's like. And it's a little bit back to like our disconnect, uh, disconnect, you know, our disconnect with biology, you know, like, like we're disconnected from our biology. So we're disconnected from our food. And in a way, I think it's like, you're your own greatest doctor, right? Like that, at the end of the day, you are the, no one can tell you how you're feeling. Like you're, if you're feeling good or you're feeling bad, or, you know, you have a huge breakfast and you want to go to sleep. I'm like, well, that's not productive. Like, especially at the beginning of the day, <laughs> you know? So I think that that, that relationship, I, I mean, I think in general, I think we eat too much. I think there's too much, eating in general. Um, I think we need, we need to be more conscious. And I mean, we're so bombarded, like you said earlier, you're talking about, you know, you eat Kittle, Skittles and French fries. And I mean, you just, the second you do that, you know, they've tapped into your, your, you know, your most vulnerable thing, which is things that normally taste like that are so rare, so rare and so precious and safe. That flavor alone, it makes your brain think it's safe. So they're 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 we're we're getting we're getting taken advantage of in that we're 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 being manipulated by our our biology to make things oh this is safe and and and, and it's rare. So you better get as much of it as you possibly can, that, that kind of thing. And then it has no nutrients and no, you know, I heard a great thing once about it the best tasting tomato and you can, you know, you can like lectins or not like lectins or whatever your relationship with tomatoes is, but they had a thing on like, 
tomatoes and they were like the best tasting tomato was the one that had the highest nutrient density. I, I, I tried to tell somebody, I go, oh yeah, the best tasting. So nutrient density is connected to flavor. Like when it, when you, when everything's optimum, right. But like you get a big, beautiful air, like lately we've had some fruit coming from the store, right. Coming from a su- supermarket. We have some, and then we have fruit that comes from the, from locally, like at the farmer's market. And you get a hold of a plum, a real plum. You're like, oh my. And then you eat one from the supermarket. I just spit them out. I won't even, they taste like air. I'm like, I go, it looks like a plum. Smells like a plum. Doesn't taste like a plum. Like, it like so, anything, yeah. yeah, it doesn't taste like anything. You're like, what is it? You know, and part of it is because we're picking the stuff green. And all, I mean, all the thousand reasons, all the stuff we're doing. But yeah, that's, I think, I think diet, I mean, the, the, the most amazing thing about humans in general is our adaptability on our ability. I mean, we're omnivores. I always, people ask me about diet. I go, well, what did Jesus say? Because they asked, they were trying to catch Jesus in a lie. So they asked him about diet and he said, Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. I'm like, bingo. Like, because we can get crazy on every direction. I only eat this. I only eat that. I just did that. And that, that, that. But we're amazingly adaptable. We can be Eskimos and live on blubber and seaweed in Alaska. And then we can be in the jungles of Costa Rica. And then we can be in the Alpine thing. I mean, we can eat a crazy amount of stuff. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, environments. I mean, you look at environments where people, you can, when you live on the equator, you can, you can just eat fruit. You can live on fruit in the equator pretty much. I mean, compared to when you live like in an environment where, you know, you're cold, like up in the Alps somewhere or something where there's no fruit, there's barely any vegetables. What are you going to eat? And then what's your genetics, but what's your output, your exposure to, you know, I mean, if you want to get hungry, get real cold, like get cold and stay cold for a while and you will be hungry beyond your wildest dream. So, and, and there's no, there's no fruit that's going to work for that. You know, it's like, you know, so I, I think, I, I just think, I, I think for me, I feel like it's one of the most dividing things that we talk about. Diet is the most just iron thing and this and that world. We're just like vigilant religious, which is cool, except we just have the ability to eat all kinds of, we're, our, 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 it's amazing actually what we can eat and survive on. I mean, the truth is, look at the garbage that people are eating and the fact that they're actually staying alive is, is a testament to our adaptability. Like the testament to our adaptability is that we can actually consume the kind of horrific stuff that we consume on a regular basis and still actually live. It's, it's just, I, I, I wonder how, like, it's amazing. Like, you know, there was a, I don't know if you know about this Indian guy, but he lived for, he He drank, he solar gazed and drank boiled water for 465 days and had no, and no, had nothing wrong except the enlarged, I think, hypothalamus uh, or something like that, like a, like a, like from that vision and your hormone, but that was it. Like all his organs were completely intact. I mean, obviously he was like this, probably like, (laughs) but, but his, he was just showing that we could use the sun's energy, what he was saying. As a, as a, you know, and he was in India and he probably didn't move all day. But my point is, is that, that we can, it is amazing what, you know, where we get energy from and how, and how adaptable we are. That's all. Yeah. I love your point about the food in the grocery store versus the food from farmer's markets. And I think that if people could taste what really well-raised meat tastes like, I mean, when I go to the meat counter, I'm looking for the reddest meat because I'm, I think that's just intuitive. That, that, that has more nutrients. The, and the reddest meat is almost always the grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised meat. I'm looking for the darkest liver. I'm looking for the reddest strawberry, most orange-orange, and the reddest apple. And, you know, I think we can tell with colors. I mean, yeah. at Erewhon in Los Angeles, they have... <laughs> this is a little ridiculous. You've probably seen these, Laird. They have $18 a pound strawberries. <laughs> and they're, they're very red. And they are amazing strawberries. I've tried these strawberries. Then you can tell there's more nutrients. Well, the macadamia nuts, like hey, the macadamia nuts are thirty five dollars a pound. So I'll take those eighteen dollars strawberries <laughs> compared to the macadamia nuts. It's crazy. How can you even? Well, that's another thing that we're running into is that to actually be able to eat well, you got it. You're going to have to be like a, you know, you're going to have to be highly. I mean, it's also where we put our value to. Like, what what will we make it? We'll drive a big fancy car. We'll wear fancy clothes. We'll wear fancy jewelry, and then we'll spend three dollars 
on some takeout food at some bullshit place. It's terrible exactly. for you. So if we connected the value of things to, to, to the other thing, but you know, and you probably know this, but do you know why we learned how to see color? Supposedly it's connected with fruit, right? Like the ripeness of fruit. To be able to tell if fruit was ripe, yeah. like to be able to understand if that was ripe or not, like to be able to see fruit and to tell if it was ripe or not. That Supposedly they say that. I mean, it's pretty, that makes sense in a way. Like we don't do anything for no reason. No. And I don't think, I mean, you wrote this in your book and I thought I was, I completely agreed with you. Like evolution doesn't make mistakes. I don't think nature makes mistakes. I don't think we have pieces or parts of the human body that are mistakes. I mean, I, even the appendix, you know, I was taught in, in medical school, the appendix is a vestigial structure. We don't have any, any use for it. And now they're finding, oh, there's unique like microbiota that can like go into the appendix and hang out there and kind of, and kind of like, they, they kind of can harbor themselves there. They can, they can, they can sequester themselves in the appendix and, and they can come back yeah. out. And then, then there are unique, um, you know, immun immunologic things that surround these pyres patches that surround the appendix. And this whole discussion around cholesterol, I think is just very interesting that, that someone would, I mean, it, it gets very technical and, and, and we get very scientific in these arguments around LDL cholesterol. But I think that the basis of the argument intuitively for me is like, why would nature create something in the human body that also kills us? when we eat things like meat and butter and saturated fat that are found in animals that humans have been eating for 500 years. But that is essentially the position of the mainstream medical establishment. That's a whole separate yeah. conversation, but. No, yeah. I would say I'd like, I mean, I'd say one thing about just on that subject, just cause it's, you know, my, and my, my, uh, again, not doing anything that our body does it like your tonsils or your, I mean, this, there's no extra pieces. Like it, we're, we don't have extra pieces that don't do anything, right? And but it's interesting about cholesterol because um, the, you know it's an interesting subject. And 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 I was you know we talk about the brain and and that the brain is something like I don't know ninety I don't know what the percentage is, but it's dry cholesterol, like it's cholesterol. Your brain is cholesterol. So I was like, so if you're taking something that actually lowered your cholesterol, I would connect like in my kindergarten class that I went to, I would, in math, I would be like, well, that means that you're reducing your brain. Like that would just be my, that would be my, like, you know, my, my, like, like, let me see a reduction in your, in your brain because your brain is made of cholesterol, but, but that's another, that's just, that's the, that's the world we live in, you know, and I talked about this earlier with somebody that we're so in debt, we're so dadded out. And I, and I, and, and I, I, I want to be, uh, uh, you know, I call it, uh, uh, Syrian, like s science experience. Like it's like Syrians or something like where it's like, Hey, give me, give me your experience, right? Give me your, that you've done this and you've experienced this as part of our thing instead of data. Cause I feel like our, the data is overwhelming. We have so much data out there and it's so overwhelming and we're so data out. I want application. I want experience. Show me experience. You, you did it. You lived this way. You did implement it and what it did for you. And then, and, and, and go from there. And I, and I feel like, cause, cause the data is, I mean, we're dotted out and how do I implement the data into my daily life? How do I, how do I use it in my daily life? I mean, that's my, one of my philosophies. If you do something every day, like you're consistently doing something, your soap, your toothpaste, your, whatever you're consuming, you need to, you need to accumulate positivity. That a little positivity over a long period of time is a lot of positivity. A yeah. little poison, a little poison over a long period of time is a lot of poison. It's like I go, yeah. you know how they used to poison the kings in the old days? Just give them a little arsenic every day, just a teeny bit of arsenic, and then eventually they die from arsenic poisoning. But it might take a few years, so it's a little bit like that. When we eat a little poison every day, it accumulates. Where if you're eating a little bit of health every day, it accumulates. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to. I want to be respectful of your time, but I want to ask you about relationships and family and community as we wrap up. Um, I was watching this movie, Take Every Wave, about your life, and I laughed out loud, Laird, at the part where you took the women's volleyball team out to Jaws after you met Gabby. <laughs> I just thought this was so freaking hilarious. Uh, that, like, this, this crazy wave, right? It's like Piahi on Maui, this, like, huge big wave, and, you know, you and your buddies. show off. I was I trying know, to show exactly. off. Come on, Paul. You, you got to impress. You got to impress the woman. You know, you got to like look at me. I'm. I am. 
I am man. I, you know, I was trying to impress Gabby. So I like, yeah, bring your team out. Let me, let me show off for you guys. We don't get a lot of opportunity in our world. You know, we don't have stadiums with people observing. We we're usually in a remote place and you need binoculars and, you know, <laughs> so just, yeah, that was, hilarious. that was, I had some of my friends weren't, weren't exactly happy about it. Cause we had always said, okay, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to bring any girls out. Right. Or whatever that means. So we, uh, you, you know, but yeah, so I did kind of go again. I did break one of the, I did break the, I did break that rule, you know? We started the podcast about disobedience. I mean, we're celebrating oh. disobedience in this podcast, so it's okay. But I mean, this is a broad question, but like, how do you think about relationships and family and community? Are there certain things that you do in your, in your marriage? Um, are there certain things you do in terms of how you raise your girls, your daughters, are there certain things you do to cultivate community that are born of your life experience, which has been very unique? Well, you know, I, I would say honesty, honesty is probably the most important thing of the, of, of the relationship with the girls relationship with Gabby. I mean, it's just about trend honesty and being honest and being truthful. I think that, you know, we can get over a lot of things, but it's hard not to get over dishonesty and, and, and lack of truth. And, and, uh, you know, so I think that's a, a, a big piece of it. I mean, my girls, I, I put some major loving on them. You know, I try to, tr I try to be there and do stuff and, and, and be active. Cause I know it's a, a passing time. I know it's fleeting, you know, and I think you, when you're in it as a dad, you think it's going to be forever, but these girls grow up and grow out it happens quick and you can't go back and go, Hey, can you just be four again? And let me, you know, participate in your life. And can I take you to school when you're thing? And so I'm trying to take advantage of that, you know, as best I can, um, given just everything going on, but I, I really make an effort to really go out of my way to, to, to be there. I also, um, you know, uh, I also speak openly with them too. I, I don't, I don't like, you know, have a different conversation when they're not around. They know me for who I am. I still pursue my, my dreams and passion. That's been a big piece of, of, you know, staying true to myself so that I can be a, a good example. You know, there's a, there's a, a great woman, Byron Katie, who's an amazing woman. And she, she, uh, you know, she, she does a lot of, a lot of like helps people a lot just in, in going through traumatic stuff. And she's a friend of ours and was, has been helpful for us in, uh, over the years, but, and she uh, has an amazing book called The Work and does some, I don't know if you know of her, but she's worth worthy of knowing. Um, but she, I asked her once, you know, what, as a parent, you know, what, what's, what's the most important thing to do for your children? And she said, show them what happiness looks like. And so, because then they can I actually see it. And then they can identify, like, oh, that's what happiness looks like, or that's what being happy. And I don't mean, you know, like, like insincere, but real, like, real contentment, real joy. And, and if you're not pursuing your things, because people say, oh, you know, once you start riding giant serve, I mean, once you have children, you're going to, are you still going to do that thing? It's super dangerous. And I go, well, first of all, they didn't ask me to come into the world. And it's not fair for me to put that on them. Well, how, how bad, how, 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 how bad would that be if I said to my daughter, well, you know, I used to surf giant waves that brought me all this incredible, you know, sensations and feeling of accomplishment. But, you know, when you guys were born, I stopped. Like, if you want to stop, don't use them for an excuse. Stop on your own. Be like, hey, you know what? Peace out. I'm good. But but don't don't use them as a thing. So I think showing them that showing them, uh, you know, and then and then I mean, obviously, the relationship with Gabby is is, you know, that's first and foremost, uh, because without that, then the whole, the whole structure breaks down. Um, and I think both her and I have learned to dance together without stepping on each other's toes too much. I mean, taking time, you have to learn this, learn the step, learn the, the steps and where to go and where not to go. And, you know, I mean, I think that that's a big, uh, and, and again, our, you know, our transparency with one another and, and, and having that kind of, you know, open communication and, and, having, you know, having respect for others' needs. And I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I don't think there's any one 
one sauce. I don't think there's any just, you know, hey, take this take this sauce and put it on everything and it makes it taste good. I think it has to do with the with the individuals. But I, I do know that uh, that you it's your job to go and make yourself do the things you need to do to be a whole person. And then you come into the relationship with a whole person. Um, not like, Hey, if they conduct themselves a certain way, then you'll be a, a you know, a, a whole person. And I, I told somebody, you know, being a dad is kind of like holding up the roof. You know, you stand in the middle of the house and you just pull the beam up. You just, you sit there and, and uh, you, you hold, you hold the beam up and, uh, and so that's, and, and then it's something that they can rely on, right? So they, they can, they, uh, they can rely on, on that roof being held up and then they can go out into the world with confidence and, you know, and, and, and I, I'm going to dictate the way I carry my relationship with, with Gabby and my relationship with them will, will probably influence the kind of men that they look for. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we have a, a, we have, you know, we've always had amazing people around just because it seems that 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 you know we we like we like uh community like you know gabby's gabby will just gather and and cook and make food for pe you know for people and we just have always have that and so they've grown up around that around exposure to a diverse group of people which makes them highly social and highly adaptable i think it's 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 uh that's important. I think that their ability to go anywhere and get along with people and kind of know how to navigate the, the humans. I think that that's, that really will have a huge, uh, uh, that'll have a huge impact on their success in life, which, you know, I don't relate, I don't connect success to just monetary, like the world does. I connect it to so many other pieces and that, that you, cause there's plenty of people that have a lot of money that are just, unsuccessful i said highly unsuccessful like beyond miserable and beyond just not good humans <laughs> so uh, but so so i think that's a big piece of it you know that 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 uh all of those 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 things and you know and and then and then you and then you keep you gotta get there's gotta be a line you know you hey cross the line can't, can't gotta cross the line like you gotta like there's gotta you gotta hold the line i think that's another big piece of of being a parent, um, you know, and, and you do that in a relationship too. It's like, there's certain things you just can't do to each other that you just, you just don't like, and if you do, your partner has to go, Hey, you're, you're getting, you're getting close or you're, you know, you just stepped over. Don't, you know, just keep each, just keep each other in check a little bit. I think it's important that we all have that accountability, right? We need that accountability. I love that idea of showing your children what happiness is. I think that like, you're you're clearly deeply happy being in the ocean, working out, being a healthy human. Like that's such a gift that you're giving your children. You know, that's really cool. Like I don't think a lot wow. of kids get to see their parents happy. I mean, you know, I grew up with a dad who was a doctor, overworked. I never saw happiness. I never saw I never saw happy parents for a variety of reasons. So that's that's really a cool thing. Um what's What's in the future for you, man? Like, what are you, what are you planning this winter for surf season? Like what, I mean, I think that was probably the, the most requested question I got. Like, what is Laird going to do next? Like what, what are your, what are your interests now? You want to foil well, I, a certain I, wave or yeah. what, what do you want to do? Well, I got, a, I got a couple, I got a couple. I mean, I have, there's always stuff on my radar. I think I, 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 I and I think I've always done this. Uh, and always just moving, you know, moving the, moving the, the aspiration, moving the goal just to the next thing. So you're always kind of pushing forward. Like, you know, I, I think if you just set up, first of all, if you set up a goal too easily reached, then you'll get there and you'll be like, okay, what now? So it seems like an elusive one. That's always just, you're just there. And then it moves from there. You know, I, I mean, I, I obviously had, uh, I had a I, I had a huge I had a, a huge day in Hawaii that kind of changed my perspective about towing. That's when I stopped towing and I ended up moving away from Maui after that and and, and started pursuing foiling. Um, my my foil dedication is connected to that 
I believe that's the only way you can really ride the biggest waves in the world, but it's also how you can ride the smallest waves, the longest waves. It's also uh, how you can go the fastest. So foiling itself and foils have just revolutionized the water sports arena uh, right now. I, I mean, if you see it, you see it everywhere. It's in wing foiling, toe foiling, electric foiling. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's in yachting, but foils in general. So my, my, you know, the majority of my, my, in fact, all my wave riding other than maybe body surfing is based around foiling. I always have a couple sets of ideas that are kind of innovation stuff that I'm working on. They kind of, I'm a little, it's a little bit must be re, kind of repulsive to live with, but it's like a dog with a bone. I just, just I just, ah, ah. it's like, I won't let it go. You know, this can be years. It can be years where the thing is, is I'm just, it's like, I poor Gabby. I just, I look, I go, man, this must be brutal. It's hard enough to live with. I mean, it's hard enough to, I actually, I say, you think it's hard to live with. You should try doing it. But, um, but yeah, so, so foiling is the thing. And I have, I have some uh, pursuits in foiling. You know, some work because foiling, because hydrofoil riding allows us to ride swells and and and, and the waves energy in a unique way. It, it it actually opens up the potential to do things that have never been done, and so we're looking at more of those. I mean, already stuff is happening, um, but I'm looking. You know, I I I usually go at least um, once a summer or twice a summer. I go to Peru because of the because they have the longest waves in the world. I've come to Costa Rica before. Um, in fact, I was at Pavoni's and the locals there were vicious and they tried to chase us out of the water, but I really what? was. I'm just saying the, that they're, the locals were vicious. I we had, we had, my friend had to explain to him that we grew up in the place that invented localism. So that probably wasn't going to work on us because we invented it where we, <laughs> where we came from. I go, we come from Hawaii and they, we invented localism. So don't try to use our thing on us. But, uh, <laughs> so, but so I go to, but I go to, I usually go to Chicama a couple of times a season as well. And there's some other locations that we're looking at right now. Some other crazy things. I have a couple, um, a couple projects. I have a, a um, uh, a film project or like a, like an expedition project that I'm working on the potential of coming up in the net in the next, probably the next year or next two years. So I'm always in pursuit. You know, I think right now it seems to be length of ride, speed of ride. I mean, we, we've already been, you know, last winter we had, we, we, we every season we ride giant surf, you know, I, I, I haven't, um, and, and not much to, you know, Gabby's dismay and, and, part of some of my business dismay, but I, I, I don't find, I spent so much time documenting, you know, all of my surfing at one point that I kind of started to get a little over that. I started to just kind of, I felt like it was taking some of it away from it, that I wasn't just getting that pure act of doing it. And, and there was something missing, you know, like the, the tribal people believe that if you take somebody's picture, you steal a piece of their soul. I mean, mm -hmm. there's some real truth to that. So there's something in that, that, so I've been doing some stuff that I haven't, I don't post, I don't film for my own personal thing, uh, but we're always pursuing giant waves every season. Every time there's a giant swell, pretty much if we were anywhere in the area, um, you know, there's a few locations, obviously, you know, California, Northern California, Hawaii, places that have giant waves will have the potential, but we're trying to avoid the 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 surf spots and look for other other waves that that wouldn't necessarily be surfable but we're actually we can ride them and you know the 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 truth is the speeds that we're going on the on our foils right now make make that well first of all the danger but also the just the sensation now it's like we're we're going so fast on these things and so smooth we can go across just ridiculously rough water so there's a lot and 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 that uh, just foil design evolves, our technique evolves. So it's, it's, it's kind of a hot pursuit in a way that keeping me engaged. Um, I've been fortunate, I think throughout my, throughout my, um, my career to, to kind of be, be blessed with, with a new discipline as I've gone. I think if I just did the, the, the same thing that I did when I was 20 for the last 40 years, I would be, I probably would be burnt out. It would be hard to be kind of enthusiastic but this other this other kind of this this things these things just come 
to you if, as long as you're you know open and willing and and foiling is i mean it's a magical once you feel it it just it just overtakes you so i i'm i'm uh and then and then if i ever want to ground i always go back to body surfing but that that i have a couple other idea innovation stuff but you know i'm, I'm working on the business stuff i got we got XPT, which is our our, our performance, uh, like lifestyle training, breathing, breathe, move, and recover stuff. And then I got uh, Superfood, which all, you know all the crazy greens products and great creamers and unreal coffee stuff. So and then and then I work with those companies and then Laird Apparel. So I'm always working with the businesses as well in in, in that. But I always there's always some sort of performance based, uh, you know pursuit that that really kind of I, I i think i have to have it to kind of feel um i don't know just to feel like i'm i'm worthy of you know of this this life that i've been blessed with so i think that's a big that's a big piece of you know of, of who i am and i got some you know i got some some friends in in the in the pursuit with me so it's not it's not a lonely place i love it i love it laird thank you so much for coming on the podcast it's it's just yes, it's incredible it's incredible to talk to you and hear about your life and your experiences. Thank you for sharing personal bits about fear and death and, and, you know, relationships and community and raising children. And, um, it's just, it's great to connect with you and I appreciate you. And I hope we get to hang out in person at some point soon.